Assalamualaikum everyone. Waalaikumsalam. Waalaikumsalam. So how are your studies going on? Getting ready for on campus classes? Yes ma'am. Yes ma'am. Andi ko aapka term test? Pharmacology ka? Yes ma'am. How is the prep going? Not good? No answer? Okay. Let's start with today's topic and that is on Hellman Pharmacy. Is my voice clear? Yes, ma'am. So you've already started with this topic with Dr. Iram and uh, you have done a few of the nematodes or the uh, nematelmanthes. And uh, just a recap about the classification of the nematodes. They are divided into somatic or the tissue nematodes and then the interstinal nematodes. And the interstinal nematodes, depending whether they are in the small or the large intestine, they are further subdivided into two different groups. When we talk about interstinal nematodes, which live in the small intestine, we have these six, uh, one, two, three, four, five or six species. And the commonest amongst this is the Ascaris lumbricoitus, which is also known as the round one. In the large intestine, we have Trituris trichura and Enterobius vermicular, vermicularis or the pinworm. And the pinworm or Enterobius is a commonest infection of children. And uh, uh, this is very, very commonly seen in the age group of about uh, uh, two to three years to uh, six to eight years. Somatic of the tissue nematodes may be present in the lymphatic system, in the lungs, subcutaneous tissues, in the mesentery or in the conjunctiva and they are accordingly uh, given different names and different uh, uh, genera. So let's skip the characteristics of the nematodes and go on to the uh, specific organism that is Ascaris lumbricoides. It's an intestinal roundworm and uh, it causes a disease which is known as Escariasis. It's a very common uh, uh, organism and Consequently, it's a very common um, SEQ question, a very common MCQ question, and as well, you will get a lot of uh, um, uh, viva questions on Ascariasis. If uh, you remember, we have uh, uh, the, since you haven't been uh, uh, at present come, uh, sort of uh, uh, familiarized with the practical protocol, but uh, a portion of your protocol is the observe, uh, sorry, a portion of your practical exam are the uh, observed stations. And there are going to be four observed stations and one of them will have the staining gram or ZN. And the second one will have either a urine or a stool uh, sample. And you would be asked to identify the ova or identify the, uh, the crystals or the other structures which are present in a urine sample. And the other two would be about certain tests. So uh, not only parasitology is important from your uh, theory point of view, it is also very important from your uh, practical component. When we talk about uh, Ascaris, we're talking about the large roundworm of man. It is the commonest human helminthic infection, not only in children, but also in adults. And a large number of people are affected worldwide. 
It can occur at all age groups, but five to nine years of the age group, this is most commonly affected by this parasite. And the reason being that these, this is the age group when children, they are playing around and they are uh, uh, generally uh, not very uh, conscious about their cleanliness. They can play in the mud, put their hands in their mouth. And that is uh, one of the main reasons why the ova of this parasite can be transmitted from the soil into the um, uh, into the mouth and it then it can start the life cycle in the individual. Geographical distribution, it is cosmopolitan worldwide, temperate and tropical areas of the globe and especially in those screen, especially in those uh, areas where the sanitation conditions, they are not very uh, good. And with poor sanitation, poor hygiene, the incidence of the infection increases in the population. Morphologically, it's the largest of the nematodes and the adult female worm may mire as much as 30 centimeters in length. The male is smaller. And if you see the two uh, male and female, you would see that they have a difference in their morphology, which helps us in the identification in a stool sample. When, they are, uh, when the eggs are passed in the fecal matter, the layer is bile stained to a golden brown. And this is the shape of the or the characteristic of the egg, which you would see in case of an Ascaris infection. This is a female and this is the male and it resembles the uh, earthworm which we commonly see uh, during the rainy season when there is rain, you would see these earthworms coming out of the mud. And if you know the uh, morphology or if you can remember the morphology of an earthworm, you can remember the morphology of a saris. Female is going to be longer as compared to the male and the posterior end is hooked in case of the male as compared to the female. The adult worms are going to live in the, la in the large intestine of man that is in the jejunum and the upper part of the Ilium. And man is the only definitive host of these organisms. I'm sorry, in the small intestine, they are going to live in the small intestine of man and man is the only definitive host. Life cycle, the adult lives in the lumen of the small intestine and the female may produce 200,000 eggs per day. This is a huge number and that is why this infection is very, very common. These eggs, they are going to be passed out into the fecal matter. They can contaminate the soil. They can contaminate the food uh, uh, in the fields. They can contaminate the water and any water which is uh, being utilized for fertilization or for the, um, uh, for the plants and for the food that can also contaminate the uh, growing plants. And if these uh, vegetables are not going to be washed properly, these eggs, they can be ingested. And uh, two types of eggs are present, fertilized and the unfertilized eggs. The unfertilized eggs may be ingested, but they are not infected. So when it reaches the stage of, fertilize, uh, of fertilized egg, that is the stage which is infective to human beings. The fertile eggs contain an unsegmented ovum. They are passed out in the feces. When they are freshly passed, they are not infected. They need to undergo a few morphological changes. And when these changes have occurred, then the eggs are in the uh, infective form. And then in, at that stage, if they are ingested, they are going to start the life cycle in the, in, in the uh, humans. What happens when the eggs are passed out in the, uh, in the fecal matter? The first stage occurs in the soil. And this... The first stage takes place in the soil, and that is the, um, just a second. So eggs are resistant to the chemical disinfectant and they can survive for months in the sewage, but they are killed by high temperatures like 40 degrees for 15 minutes. They become infective about 18 days to several weeks after they have been passed out. And this depends on the conditions which the eggs are present in. If it's moist, warm, shaded, there is no heat, there is no direct sunlight, then these organisms, they are the, these are parasites, ova, they are going to survive for a longer time period. The first stage larva develops after the segmentation of the ovum, which is about in uh, the first week. 
and then the first molting occurs. This is the second stage of uh, the larva, and this is known as the rhabditiform infective larva. And this forms about three weeks after the passage of the eggs. And once the rhabditiform larva has been formed, it can remain infective for three years. So during its stay in the soil, it is not lying there dormant. It is undergoing a few changes. And from uh, as a result of these changes, the larva which is going to be produced is going to become infective. And this infective form is known as the rhabditiform larva. And this rhabditiform larva is then able to survive in the soil for three years. Then infection occurs in human beings as a result of injection, in, uh, ingestion of uh, these lava along with the food or the contaminated water. Once they are going to be swallowed, they are going to go into the intestines. And in the intestines, they are going to be, uh, in the intestines, they are going to then develop into the mature adult worms. And once they have formed the adult male and female worms, they are then going to penetrate the in, uh, intestinal mucosa, enter the circulation, then through the portal circulation, they will be carried to the systemic circulation. And this systemic circulation is going to take them to the lungs. In the lungs, they are going to penetrate the alveol, uh, the capillaries, alveolar capillaries, go into the alveolar spaces. Within from the alveolar spaces, then they are going to uh, start uh, crawling along the bronchioles and they will crawl through these bronchioles and then they will go into the into the trachea. Once they are in the trachea, they will go reach up and then in the mouth and from the mouth they will be again swallowed. And this is the second time they will reach the intestinal uh, intestinal union. So the first time would be when you have when the uh, person has ingested the eggs. Um, when they have ingested the eggs, they are going to be swallowed. They are going to then uh, pass into the intestine. After ingestion, the first a trip to the intestine is of the eggs and in the uh, intestines they are then going to become the adult male and female worms. These adult male and female worms will penetrate the circulation and they will be carried by the portal circulation and the systemic circulation to the lungs. In the lungs pass through the alveolar capillaries, alveolar, uh, they will go into the alveolar spaces, from the alveolar spaces they will go into the bronchioles and from the bronchioles they are going to travel along this passage and then they will be again swallowed down through the esophagus and this is the second time the uh, larvae they are going to come into the uh, intestines. Over here then again they will uh, develop into the adult male and female ones and then they are going to start producing the eggs and these eggs will be passed out into the soil and from the unfertilized egg it is going to change into the fertilized egg and finally it is going to develop this infective form larva and this infective form larva is going to be released when it is going to go into the intestines. Any questions? No questions? No, ma'am. So, uh, we've done this that they've migrated to the uh, alveolar walls and then they are swallowed, then they go into the intestines and then they develop into the adult ones. Two to three months are required from the ingestion of the infective eggs to the development of the uh, ova by the adult female. So adult worm can live in the intestine of man for up to one to two years or even longer. The infection occurs from man to man, and it can also occur from uh, from uh, uh, it can also occur in the same person, which is referred to as auto infection. So if the personal hygiene of that individual is not good during the um, uh, during the uh, defecation, and if proper um, sanitation, proper hygiene is not going to be adopted, the dirty hands can carry the ova directly into the mouth, resulting in auto-infection of that individual. Clinical features depend upon the stage of the parasite. The adult worms, usually they're not going to cause any acute symptoms, but they will be responsible for symptoms because of the number of worms which are going to be present in the intestine. If there are few, for example, 10 to 20, they will not be uh, noticed, they will not be producing any signs and symptoms. Maybe the eggs may be passed out into, in, in the stool, they may be passed out in the fecal matter, and adult worm may come in the fecal matter. In that stage, they can lead to a diagnosis, but 
few worms, they generally do not produce any clinical signs and symptoms. If the burden is high, if there are a lot of uh, uh, escaris worms within the intestine, they may cause abdominal pain, they may cause intestinal obstruction, they may cause anemia as well because they are entering the capillaries and they are causing the puncture wounds in these capillaries from which the blood can, will continue to ooze. So we will divide the, uh, the uh, symptoms and the effects of the uh, worms on the host into two parts. Number one is due to the adult worms. And first of all is the spoliative action. That is, it is going to rob the host of nutrition. Most commonly, it results in a deficiency of vitamin A. And it also results in a deficiency of proteins and other nutrients resulting in malnutrition. And therefore, the growth of the child is not going to be like a normal child. The, it would be slower as compared to a normal healthy uh, child of the same age group. Number two, the toxic effects of the adult worms because of the presence of the antigens on their surface, which are going to stimulate the inflammatory response. This can result in fever, it can result in urticaria or itching, edema of the face, conjunctivitis, meningitis, any way where these worms are going to, uh, uh, to be present, they will produce a local inflammatory reaction. They will also release the toxins, which are going to be carried through the circulation to various parts, and it will produce various signs and symptoms. Then there will be certain mechanical effects because of the presence of these uh, parasites in the intestines. Number one, it can cause intestinal obstruction. Number two, because of the presence of these parasites or pressure of these parasites onto the intestinal wall, they can be intestinal perforation as well. Intersusception is a term which is used when one portion of the intestine is sort of uh, uh, forms a sleeve over the other. So it is, if, uh, if what can I say, it's uh, basically like uh, a S-shaped structure, the uh, one pound portion goes into the other and forms an S-shaped uh, uh, edging of the uh, intestinal wall. The whole of the wall is intact, but it forms an S, a folding in its uh, uh, wall, which forms, which is known as intersusception. As a result of this, there can be uh, problems in the uh, intestine, there can be certain symptoms, and this is also because of the presence of a large number of escaris worms in the intestine. Then the uh, adult worms, they can migrate to an area which is not normally in their circulation or in the life cycle. So if they go into the biliary tract, they can cause the obstruction of the biliary tract. <clears throat> And they can also go into the, from the mouth, they can go into the nose and from the nose, they can also be uh, the adult worms, they can be, or the larval forms, they can be seen through the nose. And I have myself seen a patient who came, a child who came to us and uh, uh, the complaint was there is something in his, uh, sticking out of his nose and it comes and goes. And uh, when we investigated, we found that it was the larval forms of the parasite, which instead of uh, uh, being swallowed into the, into the esophagus, they found their way from the mouth into the nasal cavity. And then that was why they were being seen by the parents uh, as coming and going out from the nose. Then due to the larva, there can be different uh, symptoms. And this is because of the migration of the larva. So if you remember the larval migration, uh, 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 where where it goes, you will be able to correlate it with the symptoms. So, and most of these symptoms, they are going to be related to the lungs because that is the place where the maximum movement of the larval forms is taking place. So, from once it is out of the circulation into the lungs or into the alveolar spaces, then the rest of the symptoms they are going to be related to the uh, to the uh, to the chest. So they will be cough, it, they could be dyspnea, they could be hemoptysis, and it also results in, in eosinophilic pneumonitis or inflammation of the uh, lungs. And this is known as Loeffler syndrome. A common viva question is what is Loeffler syndrome? And basically the answer is that it is an infection of the, uh, it's an inflammation of the lung tissue as a result of the larval form of the Ascaris lumbricoides. The diagnosis depends upon the direct and the indirect evidence. Direct evidence always when we can see the eggs of the uh, parasite or we can see the larvae of the parasite in the fecal matter, in the duodenal aspirate, 
or we can see the larvae in the sputum when the patient is asked to cuff out if the sputum within the sputum we can see these larval forms then we can make a diagnosis or the demonstration of the adult worms in the stool. When the burden of the worms in the intestine is very high, then along with the stool matter, you will see these adult worms also. And this will also enable, in, enable us in, in the diagnosis. And this is a direct evidence of the presence of a scarus infection in an individual. Indirect evidence is because of the uh, immunological response or the inflammatory response of the individual to the presence of the parasite. So it will result in eosinophilia. There can be an allergic reaction which shows on the skin. And a zero diagnosis can be carried out through ELISA and indirect heme agglutination tests. So this is the picture of the scarus and, and uh, lemurichoidus eggs in the feces. You should know how to draw this because this is a part of your uh, practical exam. And uh, uh, this is an un uh, 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 undeveloped and unfertilized ovum. This is, sorry, this is the fertilized ovum and this is the unfertilized ovum in which the uh, margins, they are going to be more wavy. This also has a wavy margin, but uh, in case of the unfertilized eggs, they are more marked. So these are the eggs of the Ascaris, which you can see like this under the microscope. And these are the adult worms. And they can be so huge in number that they can block the intestine and the patient will come with you, come to you with chronic constipation. So any questions? No, ma'am. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide, which we are going to, or the next topic we are going to start. That is, so maybe, uh, excuse me, the other slide maybe talents me. So the next nematode which we are going to study <coughs> is the Strongyloides. Strongyloides cercoralis is a species and it is also known as the dwarf or the threadworm because it's the smallest uh, nematode which we, which we come across. Geographically, it has a worldwide distribution, warm, humid areas, more common in the tropics, subtropics, and the moist uh, regions of the uh, world. More common in the Eastern Europe and in the Mediterranean region, and 1% of the population is supposed to be affected, infected by this parasite. The habitat, uh, uh, the adult fertilized female, it is going to be found burrowed under the mucosa of the small intestine in the duodenum or the jejunum. The infection is transmitted when the infective form or the infective larval form of this parasite is going to come into contact with the skin contaminated with the, the, uh, with the infective larva. So the infective larva, they will be present in the contaminated soil and they are going to come into contact with the skin and they will penetrate the skin to gain entry into the human host and man is the definitive host of strongyloides. The infective forms, when they penetrate the host skin, they are then going to migrate to the lungs and they will cause the damage to the tissues as a result of which there will be the inflammatory response in the individual as well as some immunological response. 
The adults are going to inhabit the intestine and they will cause severe inflammation and diarrhea along with the passage of blood in the fecal matter. It's the smallest pathogenic nematode. The adult is longer it's, it's, uh, um, uh, as compared to the male and the adult females, they will have a pointed posterior end, whereas in case of the females, it is going to be smaller in size and it's going to have a, a, a more uh, a rounded uh, posterior end. They are going to be present in the crypts of the small intestine and the female is ovo-vivi paris. This means that it, it lays the ova as well as the larvae in the intestine of the, of the uh, um, human beings, so of the host. So the, both the passage of the eggs as well as the passage of the lava are going to be uh, seen in case of the adult worms in uh, strongyloides. First, it is going to lay the eggs within the intestines and these eggs are going to then hatch into the larval forms, which are then going to be passed out into the fecal matter. So it is known as ovo baby paris. The eggs are arranged and posteriorly in a single row in, uh, in the uterus, which is present within the body of the parasite. And uh, they are can be seen, they are oval, and uh, they are about five, uh, five to six, 16 micrometers in length and 30 to 35 micrometers in width. This, these eggs, they are initially present within the body of the uh, parasite, and then they are going to be passed out and these are passed out while the parasite is within the epithelium of the small intestine. Once it is passed out into the epithelium, then it is going to convert into the first larval form, which is known as the rapidity-form larva. And it is also known as the L1 larva. So instead of the eggs, we are going to find the larval forms in the fecal matter. But sometimes when there is sloughing of the tissues of the intestinal epithelium, more, lots of damage has been occurred, the epithelium is going to be sloughed off and that epithelium will contain the eggs as well. And in that situation, we will, uh, be, we will be seeing the oval, uh, the larval forms as well as the, a few eggs in the fecal matter. These are the two different forms, the rapidity form larva and then the filary form larva. And there are certain differences in the sizes and certain other features. So what happens is that when the uh, lava, they are there are two types of lava. Number one is the rapidity form lava, and number two is the filary form lava. The filary form lava is the infective form. The rapidity form lava is passed out into the lumen, and in the lumen of the intestine, it can directly convert into the filary form or the infective form. This infective form then can re-penetrate the intestinal epithelium at that very place. So this is known as internal reinfection. But most of the time what happens is that these rapidly formed larvae, they are going to, once they're converted into filary form larvae, they pass out into the fecal matter. And then the fecal, uh, uh, the, uh, from the fecal matter, they may be able to penetrate the perianal skin directly. And this is then referred to as auto-infection. So once the rapidity form larvae, they are present within the lumen of the small intestine, they can have two uh, different uh, end results. Number one, they can develop into a flary form larva and penetrate the intestinal epithelium resulting in internal reinfection, or they can convert into the flary form larva, pass out into the fecal matter and penetrate the perianal skin resulting in auto-infection. The third uh, thing which can happen is that the rapidity form larva can be passed out into the feces and then it develops in the soil. In the soil, it can undergo two cycles, direct or indirect cycle. In the direct cycle, the rapidity form larva in three to four days metamorphoses into a filary form larva. Each rapidity form larva is going to form in a filary form larva. There is no sexual phase. There is no involvement of any other mating in this direct life cycle. And so from one filary form larva, one the rapidity form larva, you are going to have one filary form larva. The indirect cycle converts the rapidity form larva into a filary form larva over a period of about uh, two of uh, about five to six days. In this case, in 24 to 30 hours, the rapidity form larvae develop into a generation of male and female larval forms. These male and female larval forms will then mate, producing a second batch of rapidity form larva, 
and this over a period of three to four days will convert into a filariform larvae. In this way, each pair is going to produce 30 filariform larvae. So when the larval forms are going to be passed out into the fecal matter, this is going to result in the propagation of their uh, um, uh, offsprings. This will result in an increase in the number of the infective form of the larvae if they go through the indirect cycle. So each form larva, which is passed out by the, uh, which is passed out, So, this oh, the hospital? I'm, I'm just so we will continue with this because I have to go for an emergency. So, we will continue with this tomorrow. Or if I'm back early, then I'll take up your uh, take up from where I've uh, stopped. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you.